For the love poured out the price of freedom Let the whole earth sing, hear the praises rising And we stand in awe of what you've done for us At the cross, the hope of the world Lifted on high, calling us home with arms out wide To know you forever and love you forever You are our everything The sin erased, we're forgiven And you made a way, you are our ransom And we owe this life for the hope of the world lifted on high calling us home with arms out wide to know you forever and love you forever you are our everything the hope of the world lifted on high calling us church thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today you by watching this uh, are partnering with Bridgeport Church whether you know it or not and we're so thankful that you are so whether this is your first time with us or if you've been watching and have been with us for a long time you are counted in and a part of the Bridgeport family so thank you so much for being here with us today if this is your first time with us, head over to our website after service and fill out the new here form so that we can get some information about who you are and one of our pastors will reach out to start doing life with you. You also have the opportunity to partner with Bridgeport Church through generosity this morning. You can either do a one-time donation on our website underneath the Give tab or you can download the Push Pay app on your smartphone or you can text Bridgeport PDX to 77977. We have a lot of really new and exciting things going on here that um, all of us are just bursting at the seam to share with you guys. Um, all of that information can be get, can be you can get through our social media outlets, either Facebook or Instagram, or we have a YouTube channel, which we don't push very much, but you should absolutely go subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have some more um, exclusive content on there. And so if you just go to YouTube and you look up Bridgeport Church, you should find us. All of our past messages um, are on there as well as an hour of worship music that we uploaded a couple of weeks ago that you can just play in the background and go on your day with. 
Along with that, uh, we have a lot of uh, super exciting things that we're doing as well as our uh, weekly bridge newsletter that we announced and launched this past week. Um, if you are not into social media for whatever reason, uh, we know that there are some of you out there. And so we're starting that email, weekly email to keep you updated on all of that information so that you don't miss out on it. If you think for some reason we don't have your email, email us at info at bridgeport.church. Or you can also send any prayer requests and praise reports to amen at bridgeport.church. We are praying for you and praying with you and celebrating life together. We are starting our Canvas series this morning, which I'm so excited about. We are talking about identity in Christ, what it means to be a masterpiece in the hands of a good God, a good creator. And so each of the next uh, five weeks, as we talk about this series on Canvas, we're going to invite a new person um, of our community. You might know them or it might be a new face to you. And we're going to have them share a little bit of their story, whether it's their testimony of finding Jesus or what it means to have identity in Christ. So as we tell biblical stories of people of how they found and followed Jesus in their life, uh, we're going to bring some people from here and now to share that story as well. So today I want to introduce, uh, you probably know him, our friend Jonas. He's going to share a little bit about what it means to have identity in Christ. And then we're going to hand it off to Shannon and hear about some biblical stories about what it means to be a masterpiece of God's. Hey, my name is Jonas. If you don't know me, hello, that is my name. <laughs> Um, identity in Christ is pretty cool uh, because it's the truth. What it means to me, so the whole world's trying to tell you you're something else, which is a lie. <laughs> Great news! Jesus says the opposite. For example, the world tells you you're ugly. Jesus says you're beautiful. The world says, you're stupid. Jesus says, you're a genius. The world says, you're broke. Jesus says, you're rich. Stuff like that is really important because the words that you speak over yourself matter. For me, I tend to get in my head a lot about the things that I say or what people say about me or what Jesus says about me. And there's this conflict, this fight going on. And I have to remember, wait, no, that's a lie. What Jesus says is true. And then it makes me feel better. A great example is reading the Bible. You want to know what Jesus says about you, what your real identity is, what you, who you really are? Go read the Bible. Think about all the things that Jesus says you're loved and blessed and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty cool to know that the creator of El Mundo, the world, all of space and time is personally, intimately telling you he loves you and that you're beautiful and smart and talented, supremely gifted. You have a great hairline. <laughs> you have great skin, great fashion sense, all of this. He just wants to talk to you. That's how he talks to me. Sometimes it's really loud. Sometimes it's a quiet little whisper. Hey, it's okay. Don't do this. You're not that. That's not who you are. Oh, I know you just made a mistake. That's not who you are. Or it's real loud. Like, hey, hey, you're amazing and I love you. I guess that's just how it goes for me. But it's important. So if you're going through a circumstance where it feels really bad and people are saying bad things about you, just brush it off. It might be hard, but think about what Jesus says. I mean, I think you're pretty important. You're worth dying for. And human life is the most valuable thing. So <laughs> I think that's cool that Jesus died for me and loves me. I think I'm worthy, you know? Yeah, Jesus. Well, what's up, Bridgeport Church? Shannon here. So glad that you could be with us today. I hope that you are enjoying the service, the music, uh, Jonah speaking, Jamie hosting, and now it's all going to go downhill. I'm not just kidding, but uh, we are so excited uh, to be kicking off this new series canvas. And really the imagery behind it was this blank canvas that an artist, 
uh, begins to paint. We actually watched a few Bob Ross. Y'all remember Bob Ross with the happy little tree? We watched a few Bob Ross uh, videos while we were thinking about this message. And uh, because I, I don't know if you've ever watched this I don't, or I've ever felt the frustration when you watch him. I mean, the end, the end product is beautiful. But on the way there, sometimes I'm like, what are you doing, Bob? Like, he creates this beautiful picture and then he draws a big black line through it. And like, what is that doing there? It doesn't belong. And I wonder, and this is why we're, we're doing this message, if you've ever experienced that in life, man, things are going really good. I feel like I'm on a good path. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty picture. And then all of a sudden there's this big black tree in the middle of your canvas. So when we say identity, what we're really talking about is who, I, who was I created to be? What is the picture that God is really trying to paint with my life. God, the great artist, the creator who made trees and he made mountains and he made oceans and he made the beautiful skies. And I don't know, if you're in Oregon, go outside at night and you see the bright moon and, and, and the stars shining. Like, it wasn't God an incredible artist when he created our planet? But you know, he didn't shortchange when he created you. He didn't shortchange when he created me. He wasn't stick figure drawing uh, us while he's making beautiful masterpieces out of creation. In fact, uh, we were the apex of his creation. We are the most beautiful thing he ever created. He created us with purpose, us with intention, us with a plan. And man, we're, we're so happy to spend a few weeks here really diving into the scriptures and pulling out some principles of how you can find your identity in him and live that life to the fullest. Because we are a church that's all about people helping people find and follow Jesus. And what Jesus said was this in John 10.10, 10, that I came that you might have life and have it to the full. I came that you might have life and it might be beautiful and blessed and favored and grace. That's what Jesus has for you. And so I believe, I do deeply believe that as we dive into this series, and I encourage you to come back each week and catch this series, uh, that God is going to begin to pull back the layers of, of things that have blocked you uh, from discovering that plan. Maybe he's going to add some, some color to your life and help you begin to see the picture, the beautiful picture God has for your life. Well, the scripture we're jumping off with for this whole series, and we'll, we'll start each message with this, with this scripture uh, throughout the next five weeks, but the scripture we're jumping off with is found in Ephesians. Now, if you, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it up with me. We're going to go to Ephesians, and that's on the right-hand side of your Bible. You just put your thumbs in the middle and turn right, and, and when you get to the end, it's one of the shorter books after the red letters from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. If you don't have a Bible, you can uh, jump in with your glow-in-the-dark Bible, I mean your phone, or you can, there's a lot of ways you can, you can follow along today. But I really encourage you to follow along uh, with today's story, especially because we're going to be unpacking different characters, different heroes in the Bible. But here's our scripture for this series. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. Man, if you like to circle, underline, scribble, smiley face, star in your Bible, I would, I would do that one. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. All right, check me out. Everybody say this. Now we're crowd participation, and I know I don't, there's only a few of us in this room today, but I got a bunch of you out there. If your neighbor doesn't say anything, give them that one stank eye look. Like, you better talk. But everybody say this. Say, I am God's masterpiece. Yeah, that's what he's saying. And you are created new in Christ Jesus. Come on, say it again. Say, I am God's masterpiece. Yeah, you're God's masterpiece. And you're God's masterpiece, created new in Christ Jesus, but he didn't stop there. He says, so you can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see that in there, what you were created to be? Man, you got to see yourself as God's masterpiece, and that's how you'll discover how to do the good things that he planned for you long ago. And you'll begin to unveil the beautiful artwork that's called Your Life. Well, title of today's talk is this, Living in the Right Place. Living in the Right Place. And no, I'm not talking about address, and I'm not talking about geography. 
I'm talking about the right place in your heart. What is it to discover how to live, how to get settled in the right place in your heart? And our big idea, if you're a note taker for this message, is God's purpose for our life is activated by living in the right place. We gotta get our heart in the right place. We got, we got to get our heart in the right place first. If we're ever going to discover God's plan for our life, if we're ever going to overcome the battles, if we're ever going to progress, we, gotta get, we have to make sure our heart is in the right place. Well, today's uh, character we're going we're gonna to tackle, uh, you'll find this story in Genesis chapter 37. That's way back on the left-hand side of your Bible. It's the very first book in the Bible. We're going to go to chapter 37. And uh, the, before I, I read the scripture to you, uh, have you ever in your life, have you ever in your life uh, felt like there was some kind of obstacle or hurdle or for some of us, a six foot thick, 20 foot tall brick wall standing between you and what you're dreaming of, between you and what you're hope, hoping for, between you and what you believe? between you, what you believe God's promised. Have you, have you, have you ever experienced that? I know I have in my life. And in our, in our, in our character we're gonna unpack today, he, he could relate to us. And so his name's Joseph, and he's, he's one of the heroes of the Bible. We're gonna start reading in verse two. We're gonna read, actually only read verses two through 11, but I would encourage you to read the rest of the chapter sometime this week. It'll be some great homework, and you can see uh, in detail the story that we're gonna tell today. But it says this, starting in verse two, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilf, Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him an ornate robe when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field. And suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream and he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. At this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. I want to tell you today that there's more to know. Not more to K-N-O-W. There's more to N-O than sometimes we see. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't necessarily always like the word no. <laughs> I don't always like being told no. I don't always like when life tells me no, but I want to encourage you today from this story of Joseph that there's, there's more to know. When I was a teenager, I was, uh, I was running from God. I, I wasn't just, uh, just neutral about it. I had an agenda against God, but um. I was required to go to church. My mom drove me about to church every time the doors were open. Uh, I was required to go to church, and our youth ministry was talking about how they were going to go on a missions trip that summer to Argentina. And uh, I had no desire to go on any mission trip. I didn't much like church, God, or any of it. But then they told me that, that the people, the women there, were uh, half Italian and half Spanish. And then I said, yeah, I'm going to go on this trip. And uh, so I went on a missions trip, my first mission trip ever. And I got to be honest with you, I had zero intention, uh, zero intention of doing anything spiritual on this trip. Uh, I was just going to go out of the country on a vacation, uh, maybe get out of my parents' house for a little bit. Um, and something happened there, though. 
Something happened there that would change my life forever. Actually, I was 15 when I went on this trip, and it was only about six months later that I actually began to follow Jesus. Something that happened there that began to change my life uh, forever, and I'll tell you what it was. It was I, I heard a whisper from God. I, I knew it was God in that moment. I, I didn't want to believe it was God, but I knew it was God in that moment. You see, they, one of the nights on our mission trip, they took us to this large influential church in Buenos Aires, and, uh, they, they, uh, uh, and we were just, just a part of the service. And it was a powerful service, and, and uh, really you could sense the presence of God there. The worship was strong. I couldn't understand the word they were saying, but, the, but there, was a, there was a tangible, visible presence of God in the, in the room. And I'll never forget, even to this day, uh, the words so clearly that I believe God spoke to me that day. He actually spoke to my nose that day. And he, and he said um, that he was going to use the pains of my past to help people in my future. Man, this, and it rocked me. I was, like, I was like, who's talking to me? Like, who, who, who said that? But but I knew, actually, I knew, I knew in that moment, I knew in that moment. And then I would get mad because I would, I would think about that, that word I heard from God, that, that sense I had in my heart that God was going to use all the no's from all of my life to actually help people. That actually he was going to employ the hurtful moments of my life, the, the roadblocks of my life, all the excuses and reasons in my life to actually be a blessing to others in the future. And the, and the problem is, is I started getting excited about it. And that made me, that ticked me off because I wasn't loving Jesus even but then I would think about this and I would begin to dream about this and, and I would dream about how God could use those things that I found worthless or I found no value in. And I wonder if we just need more dreamers like Joseph who when they come up against opposition, when they come up against the pains of their, their, their past their, or their present, that they see those pains as maybe the bridge to be a blessing in their own life and in the lives of others. Because if you really want to know what purpose is, if you really want to know what the kind of purpose that satisfies, that actually scratches that itch is, it's living for something bigger than yourself. You really want to know what the beauty of life is let your life be a be a promoter of other people's beauty and you will sense a sense you'll get a sense of satisfaction because that's what you were created for to be a blessing to be blessed and to be a blessing to others God gives us a dream of what could be so we can endure the nightmare of sometimes what is and that was the hope that began to fill my heart that ultimately led to me finding Jesus as God began to develop in me this beautiful picture on the canvas of my heart. He used to, he's began to give me hope and, and purpose inside of my pain. And God gave me a dream of what could be. And it was actually that dream that gave me strength to endure the nightmare of what was in my life. You see, God called you to live a life of your significance. You have a purpose. The Bible teaches us that while you were still in your mother's womb, before you, before you were a, a, a name on, the, on a birth certificate, that God had purpose for your life. And no matter what has happened in your life, the yeses and the noes, that purpose has not changed. Your significance still remains. You are not an accident. You were put on this planet to make a difference. And you need a dream that's so big in your life that it requires a God. <laughs> you need a dream that requires God. You, you want to step into the beauty of life, step into some stuff where if God doesn't show up, you're in big trouble. Reach out and, and take a risk on some people, love some people, give hope to some people who are broken and without hope, and there's probably no chance that they would ever receive that hope. And watch God use you in a way that you've never seen him use you before. Because the potential and the price of living in the right place in our heart, the right place in our life, the potential and the price, I believe, is found in a dream. To get to the right place, you will have to fight through some rejection in your life, some no's in your life. And when you get to those rejection moments, those no moments, you'll have to keep on going because there's, there's more to know. There's more to the no's you've experienced in your life. They're not the end. They're not a period in your life. They're a, they're a comma. 
You see, many of us begin to feel stuck in life. We feel like we're missing out on life. Have you ever looked at somebody else's life and go, why isn't my life as good as their life? Maybe you're in the short line and everybody else gets the good line. But what if I told you that sometimes the rejections and the no's are all part of the plan? They're all part of the plan to get you to the right place where your purpose is activated and strengthened. I don't know if you know this, but your dream, your hope, it needs pressure. Anything that's strengthened has endured pressure. Anything that's strong has endured pressure. A diamond is only a diamond because the coal was put under extreme pressure. A, a person of physical strength is only strong because they endured pressure. Your dream needs pressure to develop. You need the fight back in your life because strength develops in the nose. Uh, when I was um, raising my children, they're all grown now. My youngest is just about 19, I'm getting ready to move out of the country. Give me a moment while I cry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but while they were young, I had a little statement that I would say often to them. Just a principle to develop character in their life. And the statement was this. Maybe you write this one down because I think it has some, some good help in, our, in my life today. And the statement was this. If you can't take the no, you won't get the yes. If you can't take the no, you won't get the yes. Here, here's what I meant. <clears throat> if my kids came to me and they asked me, asked my permission for something, and I said no, and their response was, <laughs> you know how our teenagers do. <laughs> then I refuse to give them a yes. But if they receive the no with maturity, it, it actually encouraged me to give yes. I was trying to teach them the character of being okay with the word no. Here's Joseph in this story. I, I, I love this story. He shows us that you can have this big, bold dream, but there'll be tests along the way. Hey, I mean, if when you read the rest of the story, you're gonna see this. They have this dream moment where his brothers hate him and his dad questions him. And, and then what happens later is he gets, he gets uh, his brothers are like, hey, let's kill him. And, then he's, and they're like, no, let's throw him in this pit. And so they throw him in a pit. And then, he, and then they're like, oh, let's take him out of the pit. And so they take him out of the pit and they, they, they sell him to a caravan uh, of people moving, walking by. And, and so then he goes from, the, from that pit and he ends up working in Egypt in a palace. And, and then he ends up in a prison and then he ends up the number two guy in the whole country in authority. But there was all these tests, all these no's along the way. <clears throat> but his first test, his first test, as we read today in Genesis 37, verses two through 11, his first test is rejection. He, he's the most, son, most loved son of Jacob. And, and the reason he's the most loved son of Jacob, I'm just going to give a little backstory on this. He's, he's, he's number 11 of 12, of 12 sons. Uh, uh, so he's, he's one of the babies. He's one of the youngest. And if you're, uh, if, you're an older, if you're an older brother or older sister, you totally understand why they hated him. Uh, because I, I got whooped, uh, my brother got time out. <laughs> I, I actually think my mom was easier on my brother because she just tired herself out on me. Uh, but he, he, was, he was number 11 of 12. Uh, one of the reasons he's the favorite is because he's the youngest. And, and his father, uh, his, name is, his father's name is Jacob, which is the son of Isaac. Uh, and, and so Jacob had a brother named Esau. And, without, and this is a whole other message. We won't go there today. But <clears throat> without going too far into it, uh, Esau sold his, his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Must have been some good soup. <clears throat> but in anyways, he, he, he goes on with life and 
He was a deceiver, and we, and we know this about the story. But he see, he, he kept, this girl named Rachel catches his eye. Man, she catches his eye. She was kind on the eyes, and uh, he, he, wanted to, he wanted this girl really bad. I mean, tell you how bad he wanted it. And girls, you should, you should make some guys work. Listen to this guy. Listen how hard this guy worked. Uh, Zoe, if you're listening, you should listen to how hard this guy worked. Uh, but uh, he goes to Laban, Rachel's dad, and asked permission for his daughter. And his dad, Laban says to Jacob, yes, you can, you can have my daughter, but you gotta work seven years for her. Seven, seven years for her. So he does it, man. He goes to work for seven years for his beautiful dream girl, Rachel. And they, they have their, the, 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 after they, uh, the, the next morning after they consummate their marriage, and they, I guess the, they turn the lights on. <laughs> And he looks up, and it's not Rachel. It's Rachel's sister, Leah. This guy works seven years and wakes up with the wrong sister. And the Bible says that, that she was the weak-eyed one. That's the Bible's nice way of saying she was ugly. But he wanted her, he wanted Leah so bad that he went back to Laban, and he had to work seven more years. This guy worked 14 years to marry his dream girl. And then Leah starts, Leah, Leah has a bunch of kids, but then Rachel has a baby, and his name is Joseph. This is one of the other reasons that Joseph is one of his dad's favorites. It's because this was the baby that was had by his, by his dream girl. So he's so, so, so much the favorite that he makes Joseph uh, a beautiful coat of many colors, the Bible says. And this is pretty special because in that day and age, it was really hard to get, get colors uh, into, into the fabric. Uh, and, and his brothers hated him because of it. They hated him because of his coat. They hated him because he was the favorite. They hated him because it seemed like he, he was good at some stuff. They, they just hated him. And then, so Joseph was going to have to walk through the rejection of others to fulfill his dreams. But then here comes the dreams that Joseph has, and I, I can't fully prove it, but I'm gonna go ahead and assume that Joseph's a bit annoying. Like, uh, he, he, we read in the, in, in the top of that verse, he brought a bad report to his dad about his brothers. <laughs> it means he was a tattletale. <laughs> like, he told on his brothers. No wonder they hated him. I, it reminds me, I was a little rough around the edges growing up, and when I was in elementary school, I had this teacher may, named Mrs. Love. Uh, I, I, I have no hatred against her anymore. I've, I've processed it with Jesus. We're, we're in a good space. But I'm pretty sure Mrs. Love, when I was, when I was in third grade, uh, I believe she was the she was the she devil, uh, but, um, but I remember one time she came to me because I was a little late to class, and she said, she said Shannon, uh, when Abe Lincoln was your age, she had to walk to school, and then I looked back up her, and I said, hey, when Abe Lincoln was your age, he was the president. <laughs> I, was, I was witty. I was witty, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I was a little annoying also uh, as a kid, so I can relate to him, but Joseph has a dream. He talks about how you, you're, I'm going to be the tall sheaf and you all are going to bow down to me. I don't know about you, uh, but if my baby brothers would have told me that, I probably would have, I may not have the same response, but I, I probably wouldn't have responded very positively to his dream. And then Joseph doubles down on a second dream and he talks about the, the moon and the stars and how they're all going to bow down to him. You see, one of the mistakes you'll make on the way to God's purpose for your life, on the way to the beautiful picture of your life, is you will share the right dream with the wrong people. He didn't have to share that dream with his brothers. I know he was excited about it, but just because you're excited about it doesn't mean you gotta share it with everybody. You see, talking too much, too often, trying to convince people that do not love you is not necessarily the right path for you to fulfill the beautiful picture of your life. Sharing the dream that God's put in your heart with people who just don't love you, pursuing the dream, the beautiful picture of your life, with sharing that with people who just have made up their mind already about you may not be the wisest decision because if you can walk away from, if, they, if someone can walk away from your life, let them. You shouldn't have to convince anybody in your life to love you. Here Joseph is with some people he already knows hates, hates him, and he's sharing this dream with them. 
You see, Joseph didn't have to tell his brothers about the dream. Either it was from God or he heard wrong. And it was, so it was premature for him to share it. What happens is many times we'll share these dreams, these hopes, these aspirations, these plans with people, and then we'll feel rejected because they don't respond positively to it. And then what do we do? We quit or we give up on the dream. His brothers wouldn't have cared if there wasn't favor on his life. The reason his brothers got so mad is because they already knew there was favor on his life. They already knew dad made it, well, he's my favorite. So when he starts saying that you're gonna bow down to me, this actually kind of goes along with the narrative of his life. This actually works inside the painting of his life. And some of the rejection you will face in life will be confirmation that there is favor on your life because the pressure proves that there is more in the no. The pressure and the rejection might sometimes be getting your heart in the right place where you'll begin to trust God. I know what I'm saying today is easier for me to preach than for us to live because I'm trying to figure this one out also. I'm preaching to myself today. But that's why some of us are carrying rejection from decades ago because we don't see the purpose in it. Just because rejection hits you doesn't mean that it has to get in you. If you can use it as a stepping stone and believe that it is strengthening you, I mean, James, Jesus' brother, said it this way, rejoice or throw a party when various, which is such an abstract word, various trials or pressures come your way. For it is the testing of your faith that produces patience. And if you let it have its, let it run its course, it will produce in you God's beautiful work. You're strong enough to withstand the rejections of life, whether they come from people, culture, society, old ways of thinking, your history. You are strong enough because in the same way God told me, I believe that God will use you God will use the pains of your past to create a beautiful picture in your future. There's, there's this little parable I used to hear preachers say, and I thought about it when I was writing this message. There were two brothers, and they grew up in a really abusive, alcoholic home. And after they left home, one became an abusive alcoholic, while the other one became a moral, upright, standing good neighbor in their community. And when asked, when the two were asked, why did you become an abusive alcoholic? Or why did you become a moral, upright, standing, positive influence in our community? It's interesting, they both gave the same answer. Given who my dad was, how could I not? You see, if you won't let rejection in the nose of life get in you, they're gonna come to us. We can't stop that. That's life. In life, you're either in a trial, coming out of a trial, or getting ready to go back into one. Good news. <laughs> but if you'll let it not get in you, not let it define you, and if you'll fight back on the inside where the battle is going on, if you will allow the Holy Spirit of God to strengthen you, you'll be able to go through whatever you wanna fill in the blank with and you will still have a purpose. Because if you can take the no, you will experience the yes. The rejection, the rejection will strengthen you. I'll never forget, now real quick, if for some reason you want me to sit on a pedestal, go ahead and turn this video off and thank God for whatever I wrote because I'm about to fall off whatever pedestal you may have at one time put me on, not assuming that I'm on one. Um, let's say this together just to make me feel better. Everybody say, I'm not okay. Yeah, look at your neighbor and say, you're not okay. Say, it's okay. Yeah, God loves me anyway. Yeah, so I, I say that to say this. So I was, um, when I was in college, there was this, 
there was this uh, dark-haired, pretty, pretty little girl running through the college talking about how she could get two tickets to the AFC Championship game between the Pittsburgh Steelers and Indianapolis Colts. And, and, but we needed somebody to buy the tickets. And so I went and begged my dad for the money because I wanted to go to the game. I, yeah, she was pretty, but I wanted to go to the game. And so we went to the game. I bought the tickets, went to the game. After the game, we drove way back to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm dropping her off at her apartment that night. And as she's getting ready to get out of the car, she leans over and gives me an extended hug. And all of the men can totally relate with me. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that when a girl leans over and gives you an extended hug, it means that she digs you. And so I knew that. She showed that. I believe that. She may have a different story. <laughs> so the next day after school, I was like, can I take you out for some food? And she said, sure. So I took her to McDonald's. Don't judge me. I was a broke college student. And I said, you can have anything on the menu. <laughs> took her out for McDonald's and we, we, we had our McDonald's. And then I, and I went for, uh, we said, can I, I want to go for a walk? Can we chat? And she said, yeah, sure, let's go for a walk. So we're walking through the parking lot. We get about halfway through the parking lot. And I turn around and I stand there with my shoulders, my broad shoulders square. And, my, and I, got my, I got my sexy look on. And I look at her and I say, I'm going to let you date me. That is, honest to God, that's a quote. I'm going to let you date me. Dude, if a guy said that to my daughter, I would expect her to punch him in the throat. And this little girl, she's my little girl, this, this tiny little pretty thing looks up to me and she goes, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the rejection will strengthen you because the fight was on. I knew there was more to the no. For me. I, I found an article recently written in 2017 by uh, doc, Dr. Gortzen. Uh, on the, it's in the Wall Street Journal and it's titled The Secrets of Resilience if you want to go check it out. But uh, he was referencing a, a 1962 study that was done of 400 famous 20th century men and women uh, and, and, and the 400 they cho chose had to have at least two biographies written about them and have made a positive contribution in the world. So this is what this article was about. Uh, these 400 20th century men and women who had at least two biographies and had made a positive contribution. What he found in his study was less than 15% were raised in support, were, were, less than 15% were raised in supportive or untroubled homes. Less than 15%. 10% were raised in a mixed setting, but 75% of them, check this number out, this is crazy. 75%, 300 of the 400, grew up in a family of severe problems, poverty, abuse, absent parents, alcoholism, serious illness, or some other misfortune. Think about that. 420th century men and women who made a positive contribution, who made the world more beautiful, whose canvas was on display to promote life and hope for other people. 75% of them grew up in rejected environments. And the quote at the end of it was this, the normal man is not a likely candidate for the Hall of Fame. I thought that was awesome. Hey, you're a likely candidate for a Hall of Fame. Yeah, I know you've experienced some abuse in your life. I know you've experienced some disappointments in your life. I know you've experienced loss in your life. I know you've lost jobs and lost relationships and lost money, and you've experienced the rejection of life. But you know what? You are a candidate for the Hall of Fame because you, you're not dictated by how your life happened to you. Uh, you're dictated by how you choose to respond to the life that happened to you because when that pressure comes, you're not gonna let it get on the inside of you. Rather Rather, you're going to let it shape your heart, put it in the right place, and keep moving forward with Jesus. You have a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. And if you'll give yourself to it, you will see the beauty of life come to life. You see, opposition and rejection are not just qualifiers to the purpose of God. The no's in life are strengthening you and making your life more beautiful. In Genesis 37, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. No, let's throw him in a pit. You thought your family was dysfunctional. They're like, no, let's sell Joseph in a caravan. Let, let's get rid of this guy. They, and, they, and, then, and, then, and then he ends up in Potiphar's house. Like he goes to prison. Like this guy had enough, there was enough times that life happened to him that he should have just 
quit, threw in the towel, survived the rest of his days, just breathe oxygen until you're done breathing oxygen. But not Joseph. He decided to look rejection in the eye, look the nose in the eye, and let them define for him, the, the, and strengthen him, and confirm for him that God had a plan for him. And at the end, God's dream came true. That's why it says in Romans chapter eight that God works all things for the good of them that love the Lord. Think about that. If we had a plate and we could just put all things on it, good, bad, and ugly. What's the most successful, most epic thing that's ever happened in your life? Yep, he's gonna use that. And what is the most painful thing you've ever been through? Oh yeah, God's, God's gonna employ that. This is how strong and beautiful God is. God is gonna make the thing that tried to kill you, hurt you, take you out, and crush your hope. And he's gonna force it to work to make your life more beautiful. That's how good he is. Because God is in the business of taking dead things and bringing them back to life. This is what we see in the life of Jesus. Not only in his own life when he was dead and he came back to life, but Jesus screwed up every funeral he ever went to. He is in the business of bringing dead things back to life. His first miracle he ever did, the first open bar, it was he turned water into wine. He took something that was unwanted, unuseful, unvaluable, and he made something priceless out of it. What are the unuseful, unwanted, unvaluable things that you feel are in your life, in your past? Hey, we serve a God that if you'll follow Jesus, if you'll put your life in the hands of Jesus, he takes those things and he transforms them into things that are priceless, into things that are beautiful, beautiful into things that are wanted. You see, the pit for Joseph was preparing him for the prison. He had already been alone. But the prison was preparing him for the palace because he began to even have authority while he was in the prison. But he had to determine to outlast and outlive the nose of life. He decided that he was going to live God's dream. I'll never forget when we decided to start Bridgeport Church. I got really excited about it because I believe this is what Jesus wanted me to do. So I did what any normal person does when you're excited about it. I started calling my friends. And because I've been doing this for 27 years, a lot of my friends are pastors. And I'll be honest with you, when I told my friends I was gonna start a church for the unchurched in, in the Portland area, most of them were like, no, don't do it, run! Because, you know, in Portland, we have a reputation for not necessarily being, not necessarily being a, a, a Jesus-following community. And that's not an accusation, it's just a reputation, right? But the truth is, and so I, I got a bunch of notes, even from people who I thought would be excited for me. But we did it anyways, and since we've done it, we have had the beautiful privilege to serve this community to lead people to faith in Jesus, to feed people food and help people with shelter and to help families and help kids and, and be with people in their, in their losses and be with people in the, in the beginnings of their life and, and serve the schools. And I, and I could go on and on of the various ways. We spent money to drill wells in Africa. We've, we've supported missionaries in Costa Rica. We've We've, we've sent teams to Southeast Asia. We've, because we didn't give up in the no. And as I close, maybe you're in a pit today. Before you curse the pit, consider that it may, maybe, just maybe, it might be part of the plan. And begin to thank God for the strength to make it through. Have you ever gone through something and you thought it was the end? But now that you look back and you kind of peer into the, the history books of your life, you can see beauty that came from it. The, per, the person you met, the places you went, the wisdom you learned, the life that was experienced. It may not have happened had you not gone through it. God loves you, he has not forgotten about you. 
He is still creating. Creation wasn't an event. It's who he is. And he's not done with your life and your purpose. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you are at work in our lives. I pray today for those, those of my friends who are watching who may not know you, who have, may not have chosen to follow you, that today they would make that decision. There's no secret handshake. There's no, there's no, there's no performance. There's no class. It's a choice to go the direction that Jesus is going and to receive the forgiveness and grace that he gives freely to us. So I pray, God, that they would do that today. And you would confirm in their heart their salvation. For my friends who are watching today and they might find themselves in a pit, they might be reflecting on the nose of their life, they might be searching through the rejections they've experienced, they might be waiting in the pain of a current moment. I pray today, God, first of all, that your grace would be sufficient for them that your power would be made perfect in their weakness, that today they would trust and lean into and fall back into the arms of grace, the hope of Jesus. I pray today also, God, for my friends who have dreams in their heart, a hope for their future, that you would surround them with the right friends who will encourage them along this journey. And I pray in closing, Father, that you would give each and every one of us hope and belief that you are at work in our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown. salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee sent of heaven the very ones who nailed him to that tree. And oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. my Jesus spilled and the curse of sin 
has no hold on me whom the sun sets free always free indeed and now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled and now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the sun sets free oh is free indeed and know that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and and honor unto you.